Hi there, I'm Dick Allgaier. When we set out to work a remote viewing target or project, the remote viewers aren't told anything about it. We're only given a set of random letters or numbers. In fact, we don't even know who we're working for. Well, it turned out in this case, we were working a mystery involving the Grand Canyon. Now, I'm not a Grand Canyon mystery researcher. What I know about it is what I've remote viewed. But it turns out, this is quite an interesting project. You see, there are many theories about what created this wonder of our planet. Accepted mainstream science says slow erosion over eons. But there are other theories. One theory involves tectonic upheaval, releasing a vast amount of water which carved the canyon suddenly. The so-called thunderbolt theory postulates that an electric or plasma discharge between the planets created both the Grand Canyon and Volus Marineris on Mars. Simply put, the theory says Volus Marineris and the Grand Canyon are scars caused by a massive planetary-sized electrical arc. Given the creation of the Grand Canyon as a blind target, would a remote viewer see a massive energy event? When investigating the Grand Canyon, researchers come up with a number of interesting data points that push the boundaries of both history and science. From the Federal Reserve and discoveries of hidden gold, to apparent Egyptian artifacts, from Nibiru to the Anunnaki, the Grand Canyon seems to hold many mysteries. And in working this project under completely blind protocol, we found ourselves smack dab in the middle of all of it. This is Big Square, RoadToRoot.com. I am really jazzed and excited about a, a target I gave to Dick Allgaier to remote view. Uh, it's one of the most important targets, I believe, in the history of humanity. Um, the specific target is how was the Grand Canyon created and the unique features within the canyon, how were they created? Because I do not believe it was created by millions of years of the Colorado River running through that area and carving out pyramids and all the other things that are going on in the Grand Canyon. I wanted to know how it was really made and specifically how were those pyramids within the Grand Canyon, the mountains that looked like pyramids, how were they created and, and what was the process? Was it geological? Was it uh, man-made? Was it alien-made? I don't know. So I created a number and I tasked this specific target and from the early reports I'm hearing amazing stories of pyramids with gold involved, people actually measuring things out and creating the, the pyramids within the Grand Canyon that are ancient and running Literally, they are so old they're falling apart, but if you look at the names of the pyramids within the Grand Canyon, you'll see they're all named after Egyptian gods, and, and it was just an amazing idea and target. So let's try to jump right into this and see what we get here, because it was a very interesting target. So it's eight, nine, two, one. And straight off the bat, there's energy here with this target. Very energetic target. Um, buzzing, fizzing, uh, really energetic, really volatile, chaotic type energy. It feels like this in nature. It feels like a big ball of explosive energy uh, that radiates outwards. Uh, very fizzing, very little particles that kind of flow outwards and dissipate as they go. So lots of moving particulates to this. Very bright uh, whites, yellows, pinks, blues, lots of hues of this. Very rainbow-like in hues, lots of colors. Very effervescent, as I said, uh, it feels like it's bubbling, it's moving, um, dispelling and radiating this energy. This feels like it's an event in the past. Uh, so I'm going to write past event. Definitely feels like it's a target that happened in the past. Feels like it happened outside. 
in an outside location uh, feels more natural than man-made. Um, feels like feels like more than one event. Feels like there was a main event that it probably happened at night. It feels like it's quite dark. Feels like I can see stars. Maybe stars are a key to this as well because it feels like at some point uh, this energy moved or dropped. Um, so it feels like um, feels like it could possibly originate in the sky or above, drops down or was seen above and uh, radiates downwards because there's this this radiating type element to this to this energy it kind of radiates pulsates and all this warm particulates uh, radiate off of it uh, so we have a yeah we have a really strong very strange esoteric type glowing radiating pulsing energy source very very strong very very powerful um, very interesting um, and it feels like at some point this has seen a Above in the sky or drops down from the sky so it feels like it feels like it, if I was a life at the target and there are there is a life at the target and I feel like he's caught up in this kind of event watching it or, or being involved as it occurs it feels like you know if, if, I, if I was the life I'd be looking up and the event would be here and it would be bathing me in its light and its energy I had this energetic pulse pulsation that felt like uh, the potential of uh, energy along this path or a protection, a barrier. And I see Earth. I, I sense Earth with fault lines like a, like a fault line. Like Earth, tremendous pre pressure, a uh, shale, a rumble, a ge geologic rumbling. It's rocky, it trembles with tremendous pressure, it slips. There's a tectonic shaking, there's dust, there's a passage that's blocked. There's the earth, something associated with this target is has to do with the earth shifting tectonically that may cause something to be hidden or sealed. And I, I got a really good visual of a um a panoramic scenery with a very curvy S-shaped landmass. Initially, as I, as I was drawing this, once in a while I would sneak in a thought, oh, is this a seashore, is this a, a seascape? But what I picked up was a winding, warm sea sounds, sea smells, and, and shore sounds, or, or water sounds. Now I see water rushing like a huge slow moving river it's brown it's not it's not clear water it's not ocean water it's like a tsunami it's it's there are things it's going through things and around things with great compelling un force that can't be denied like almost a great event of the great flood, like the great uh, the great destroyer is what comes to me. And then I see things encrusted in stone or mud. This reminds me of what you see of Pompeii, people frozen in death that are embedded in a in a rock or hardened mud medium. It could be volcanic ash. Uh, it could be uh, mud from the flood. But there are pieces of a civilization. This is buried, it's earthy, it's silent, it's very old. It, they're almost like fossils, they're so old. There was a sudden catastrophe. It was an old civilization, and these are remnants of it. They're preserved in time. Pieces of things that are mad and made are forgotten. This is debris of a civilization that's encrusted and entombed. The colors are gray and brown. And an archaeologist could have a field day here. 
And now I see not water, but a broad, beautiful plain of green. There are like hedgerows. There is vegetation that's grown in patterns that are irregular, but have some kind of meaning. So uh, not quite a labyrinth, but kind of like a labyrinth since there are trees and it's green. Seen from above, it's like open fields, uh, broad plains with significant vegetation. But then down below, there's very interesting archeology span below this. It is things buried in time, like centuries worth of dirt have piled up and compressed this. Um, geolo not geologists, archeologists might not think Okay, if there were archaeologists here, they they scratch the surface, but they need to go a lot deeper. Um, this would be a place where you would like have a mine, and the miners would find something to go. Hey, what's this? And scientists would say, "Don't look at that. Never mind." But it's there. It's very deep. It's very old. And the key to all of it is my work in the. Grand Canyon as it relates to the Federal Reserve and our unbacked fiat money system. Down and things keep popping into my head like this. An old building, a big, imposing, solid government style building. Now this was out of protocol, so I just want to get this down and move on. Just put it on paper, move on. So I'm again trying to get my mind calmed down to begin the remote viewing session. And this flashes into my brain men sitting around a table, old men in suits at a meeting, they're very animated, they're passing papers back and forth, they're talking, they, they may be arguing. I see one of them closer, he's, he's a stern, gruff, no-nonsense man, he's an old man, and I get a sense of those old starch collars like in the 1800s or the early, uh, like 18th, 19th, early 19th century or even 18th century when they had uh, suits with these funny collars that were were very tight of that style like someone who would have a handlebar mustache the feeling that came to me was like JP Morgan uh, the Warburgs the that kind of bankers businessmen Rockefellers uh, titans of their time, but this was a pastime. My, my objective here is to find out what's really going on in the Grand Canyon, why we can't go there, why the government shut it off, why there's no mining allowed anywhere near the Grand Canyon, and what is going on. And I, I think hopefully when Dick's done with this project, it'll, be, uh, it'll shed some light for humanity on what's really happening the things they aren't telling us is so important. I'm underground and I see some type of marks on either wood or, st or stone, carved, etched, very precise but old, very, very precise calibrating measurements. These are meant for some kind of calibration, but it's technology that seems very old, so precise but not modern. This seems ancient, ancient, ancient. Um, they would have, I, I can't figure out how these were made, but you, uh, if they're very old, you would think not modern technology, but these marks could have been made with a technology that is more advanced than we have. And then I see people working in this same location, which feels underground to me. They're taking measurements, they're craftsmen, they're master builders. Uh, some of them are down on their knees doing something precise. And they're using old style tools. These are the kind of tools that if you want to get something vertical, you would hang something on a string to measure it, or um, a bubble in water. Uh, to determine if it was horizontally level, uh, compasses, that type of tools, old, precise building craftsmanship, these people are constructing something. And
people digging. These are those people digging. These are these people that smell different. They are slight. They're smaller than today's human being. They would they would like only come up to here on I'm six one. Sinewy. Uh, very muscular but thin. Not frail. Very strong, but just smaller. Uh, their diet is they have a smell because of their diet. They chew on uh, certain leaves or bark that gives them a pungent smell of body odor. Their sweat and body odor is something that could be from a thousand years ago. And I see them working physically, could be underground. The, the sense of shovels and gloves, um, constructing something. And this is a time slippage, this is ancient, this is way, maybe a previous culture, previous civilization. These guys are not modern humans. Okay, records are stored here. Those who store the things here are concerned about time. They're concerned about geologic time. They're concerned about earth changes affecting what is kept here. If you were on a planet and you knew the planet went through, uh, if you had to store something for 50,000 years, how would you store it if you, you would want a place where there was not going to be seismic activity, but there's, it seems like there's no way around it. So that's a concern here of storing things. There's a hidden entrance. Uh, this is the first impression I had, the first ideogram, my first two seconds was uh, different levels and in one level, a hidden place, things are stored. And it looks, looks like gold to me. I, I picked up on, on these vast amounts of stuff, rows and rows of, of what seemed like stolen wealth, booty or bounty, a reserve, riches, um, and the sense of gold-like. So much that I, uh, I ensured I had my yellow stylus out because I could, I could literally feel the sparkle or sense the sparkle of this immense um, array of, of wealth. A Walmart underground, and the Walmart is filled with gold. There are ingots. There's a place over there where some of it has been melted down and recast. They've, they've changed the, the physical appearance of it into... Um, it's different. There's, some of them are uh, more square than our gold bars. They've got a stamp on them that's very important that identifies them, but it, that's been added. Along the side, there are things that are just too precious to be melted down, um, like that animal that, that I saw, statues, uh, symbolic things, and they're stored. And then there's another place off this where other things are stored that are not gold. Um, they're of great value and they uh, hold information that is needed to be kept. Um, I don't know if it's documents, if the, it would be, if they were paper documents they would have turned to dust long ago. Something that's kept that is a record that is important that is not going to deteriorate over a long, long time. Now I'm looking for an interface between land and this place that is uh, down below ground. Um, it's a natural looking place, but the, where it transitions from the outside to the inside is disguised. It's camouflaged. You could walk right by it and you wouldn't see it. It has a heavy, heavy door that's on some very high-tech rollers. But it's shielded. It, it can open, but only for those who want to open it. You couldn't open it if you weren't allowed. You wouldn't see it if you... You could be told that it's in the area and you, you would not see it. And then I see huge gears. These are gears bigger than this room. They would be the gears that you would see in like the inner workings of Hoover Dam. Um, 10, 20, 30 feet. Heavy. Uh, 
high tension metal that it it has a uh, it's an opening mechanism but it's very very big uh, yeah nine ten feet heavy well machined like you'd find at a bank vault only bigger the the size the uh, the vast expanse of uh, these working chambers um, I picked up uh, under terrain uh, feature it was uh, facility like uh, many, many work areas, chambers, with a, a very large bottom chamber. And in this, in this bottom chamber, felt cool, I sensed activity, very large bottom chamber with like oversized furniture. I picked up on a cross, a cross-like structure, I got uh, that visual. But what was really notable is I also picked up on a sense of blood, of, uh, of blood in several areas. He's pushing like a wheeled cart. He's in a long corridor. This is a very clean, well-kept place. Uh, smell of old, polished concrete, like concrete that's really, really old, but not crumbling. Um, maybe it's rock. It's like polished stone. It's not. It's not concrete like a sidewalk. It's like uh, the floor of a very fine building. It's old, so old that it's smooth. And somebody's pushing a cart with something valuable that has to do with record keeping and um, things of great value. Things of great, great value that are kept in their proper place Secured. The things they aren't telling us is so important. And just as extra proof, take out a $1 bill and flip it over and you're going to see a pyramid on the back of the $1 bill. The $1 bill is the only piece of paper from the Federal Reserve that has not been upgraded and changed. It still has that pyramid with the all-seeing eye at the top of it. It still has the Great Seal of the United States and if you look at that pyramid, there's bushes and brush around the base of the pyramid. You look at the Egyptian pyramids, there's no bushes or brush around that in the sand. Back to that pyramid I mentioned that's on the dollar bill. I see that place and it's not just rock. It's got carvings and very fine uh, hieroglyphs, hieroglyphic stuff on it. Symbols, writing uh, figures carved into it. It may be trimmed in, in gold and the capstone, the top of it, is, is actual energy. This is a very interesting place with great importance. This is an energy source. This is, this is something that has to do with ley lines, and it may, it may involve uh, places on Earth and places elsewhere, and I think I don't want to get into that too much. I'm working the I'm working the target, and I awake to deep space. It's beautiful. There's a star field in front of me, and I can see like a heads-up display. I can see colored lines that go from one point to m many light years away and then turn and then turn again off into um, it may be the far reaches of our galaxy or it may be to other galaxies I mean just incredibly long distances waypoints jump off spots uh, I don't want to not use wormholes but but places that from here to here these are trade routes these are, there are energy beams that have been created somehow that you get on this and you can ride it to not a different place, but they, they may be trans-dimensional, uh, trans-temporal, trans, uh, they transit more than just uh, space-time or, or they, they transit more than just a, a vast distance and some of the colors have different meanings a trade route um, something 
that could be for healing, that could be for communication, that could be for um, a thread that connects consciousness, the consciousness of the universe to the consciousness of the Creator to all of our consciousness. Those lines are very important. So, wow! I don't, this target is incredibly complex. It traverses time and space, civilizations and cultures. Now I'm suddenly in a place that is big and ornate and it's like vaulted ceilings, domes, uh, things carved, very fine artwork. This is something that would make the Sistine Chapel look like, ah, that's minor. This is, this is one of the greatest halls or cathedrals you could imagine. Fine, fine artwork, engravings, statues, uh, symbols, um, masterworks of art. The whole thing is a masterwork of art. It's, it's huge. And the thing about it is, it's dark in here. It's sealed off from the light. There is no natural light. Now, I can perceive it as a remote viewer because you don't need light. The idea of it, and then it forms an image, so you can see in total darkness, total darkness here, but I can make it out. A beautiful, beautiful place that is unseen for a long time. God, I'm seeing this, and no human in my lifetime, I don't think, has seen this. Maybe many lifetimes. This would be the greatest discovery. When was this sealed and why? And there are, and there are many things in here that are uh, artifacts, symbology that encompasses, it feels to me like many civilizations of Earth. You have statues like old uh, gods that like the Incas or the Mayans would make uh, out of gold. Um, tablets with ancient writing. Uh, again, this is dark, but I can perceive it. It's This is closed off. There's no light in this place. This is a sealed place. There are uh, carvings of winged beings. There's a snake cobra. There's a snake artifact. This is a carving or a, might be stone. It could be encrusted with jewels. There's a cross that's also got jewels in it. It's, it seems thicker than our normal crucifix, but a cross shape, uh, beautiful colors. I see a Nazi symbol that doesn't mean the Nazis like Germany. It's older than that. It's ancient. And then something with a light source with uh, golden beams coming off it. Beautiful, priceless artwork kind of thing uh, in a storage place that's, that's closed off. And this is, is encompasses different cultures and civilizations. A, a some type of purpose-built ceremonial structure, uh, possibly a vessel. As I, as I probed the fluid, it was warm, salty, I got the sense of red, so I'm going to call it blood, and I'm going to call this is some type of uh, purpose-built ceremonial container that um, has something to do with, with utilizing blood. Drawing this, this particular uh, artifact, <clears throat> I was getting a real sense of uh, either I have uh, some biologic here, or it is a replication of a, of a biologic in the form of, uh, of a symbolic structure. So uh, a large petal-like um, uh, opening 
Um, and when I say it feels vulva-like, it's, it's, it looks like a, a petal or a flower or orifice or opening. Um, I sense life, heavy smells, warm, uh, a variegated texture. Um, so the conclusion coming out of this particular um, perception is uh, body part or, or symbolic structure. I picked up this this altar-like setting with a, a looming central figure that's facing, I guess, the uh, the business end of, of the altar. I sensed a power and energy. I mean, a lot of power and, and energy. I also sensed, like, respect, paying homage. Uh, but there was this radiance um, coming from this this being and this altar. A mythological creature or a real being? I, I saw this. Uh, this has an animal like snout, uh, piercing beady eyes, something that could be wings. Um, this, this doesn't seem like a carving or a statue. This, I probed it and it seemed alive, and I just didn't want to get into that. But speaking of life forms, we have a menagerie of life forms, and let me get to those. As I was working this target, and I was out and had very experiential target, people kept parading in front of me. They, they didn't parade in front of me. My consciousness saw them as a, as a series of images, and I'll, I'll just take you through these. The first person was the small, slender hominids. These were the guys that were like working in the underground place. They're not current people. I saw the cone heads. I saw someone with elongated skulls, thin skulls. Very interesting looking people. I saw, this one reminded me of a hobbit. Um, little small people with some kind of headdress. Um, like the hobbit was based on a real, a real thing and I saw them, it was just really odd. And then I saw an E.T. that looked just like Steven Spielberg's movie, E.T. Same uh, neck and it was like, oh, Spielberg modeled that on the real thing. And I saw it. Then I saw a very tall, huge giant. This is when I was working this while getting a massage and something crashed off the wall, startled the hell out of me. So very tall, huge giants. And then uh, what I call, for lack of a better word, the Anunnaki. Um, bearded, very fine, like, look like the wise man. I label him masters. Very tall, refined, elegant, handsome, uh, telepathic. It doesn't speak in, in words as much as musical murmurs. Now, how's this for a way to communicate? Murmuring musically in a telepathic way. That would be a, a means of communication. That's something I've never thought of in my life. Highly evolved beings. Highly evolved. The ornate gown this individual is wearing. Also on the headdress, I thought the, the stylization uh, when I when I reflect on the backside, it's sort of reminiscent of of DNA. This guy. If all those beings were part of a DNA library, this is the librarian. This guy has something to do with DNA. As I was probing, I was drawing. I started to draw a landmass, and I started to just draw an expansion below that landmass, an energy expansion, a, a tremendous energy expansion. And and this model isn't a. Um, I don't think it de depicts a, 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 an area, even a large area like this. I think it's, it's more symbolic of something much, much greater. But I had this sense of a massive feminine energy that was pushing out from Earth. And this, this energy seemed agitated, frustrated. Uh, I could sense the vibrations pulsing upward, and it's vast, uh, vast amount of power almost like itself replicating in its energetic qualities. Um, so you have this energy and um, it's, it's kind of strange because, you know, at some, at some points I see this energy and it feels kind of like 
almost triangular kind of in shape like this pulsating and throwing off radiance and particles and stuff um, but then at other times it feels almost like it morphs and changes and it's almost like a like a human type shape you know I'm trying to draw these layers of uh, radiating light here probably not doing very well with this but kind of like radiates light and energy outwards that dissipates and uh, throws off this aura outwards in all directions very bright in here very like white blue um, but moving churning you can actually see the energy kind of like moving uh, it feels like little particles or stars of light moving within inside this energy um, now this energy itself feels like, it's, as I said, it feels very esoteric. It feels like the energy itself has some kind of um, aliveness to it. It doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel physical. This doesn't feel physical at all. Although, when you see it at certain stages, like this triangular ch shape feel to it, it kind of appears physical, but I don't think it is. Um, now this, this, that's kind of hard to, to say. And it also, it's almost like, this feels like it's, it's almost like a classical UFO in style, in shape and form. Because it feels like it's above, flying, moving in a form like this. Uh, rather than in a form like this. This feels a bit more like it's involved communicating, talking, uh, inspiring, being creative. Uh, it is, yeah, it feels like a creative type presence um, at that stage. So it feels like a form that can change shape. It feels like an energy that changes shape. It doesn't feel physical as we know things physical, you know, that you can touch and so on. Um, but it can appear to be physical or it, if it changes its properties. Very energetic, very powerful. It has this, so it's physical and it has this consciousness, so it feels alive. It feels like it has uh, conscious actions, but it's different. It's, it's not like you and me. It's very, very different. Um, it's very hard to put into words. Uh, it's, on a, it's, on a, it's on a totally different level here. Um, if I had to say anything, it would be uh, higher being. Uh, if it, it feels so different, I'm just trying to put I'm just trying to put in words feelings here because remote viewing is a lot about feelings. Um, I'm trying to interpret my feelings here into words. Um, it's not it, it's a higher being. It feels different dimensionally. Dimensionally different. Um, so it's alive, it feels alive, it feels conscious, it has thoughts, it knows what it's doing, um, it is, is interacting, um, but it doesn't seem to have the same kind of emotions as we have. So it's emotionally different. Um, yes. But it interacts, it interacts with our life, it interacts, it wants to interact. Um, it feels like it's here on a go, it feels like it's, it feels like it's almost here to be inspirational. Uh, to help with a change. Uh, so it feels like, yeah, it does feel like a conscious kind of energy with a, sp a spiritual higher kind of value that wants to instill a change. It feels like there's a lot of like peace, love type situation here. You know, it doesn't feel hostile in any way at all. Hostile doesn't feel like any part of what this, this, I'm calling it a being now, this energy, yeah, energy being thing could, could be or do. Very effervescent. Uh, radiating this energy. Uh, and this energy does kind of permeate the, uh, the physical location it's in. And not only that, um, it has very strange properties of this energy as well. It distorts. 
time and space. I can see these uh, ripple type, very strange ripple type eff effects that are happening in the, in the vicinity of this um, energy. I, all I can do is call it an energy. This is the uh, this energy energy being type thing. Um, and it's very strange because you can actually see the effects. It's almost like seeing ripples in water, um, but it, there is no water. It's it's actual dimensional space uh, in and around the the energy thing here. So I want to show these kind of really weird, strange ripples that that, that also dissipate farther away from the the source that you get. Um, yeah, so it feels like this is a, an energy source. Um, feels like it has a connection to above or, or the night sky. It feels like it's not. I feel like I see stars. Feels slightly more colder, more bluer. Feels like I'm in an outside natural location. You know, it feels rocky in places. Uh, it feels warm. It feels like a past event. It does involve a life form. It feels like this is a some kind of energy type being type energy from another place, a higher being, another dimension, very strange like that, very inspirational, very creative, it wants to inspire, it wants to help. Um, and it does feel like it can and does exist in different dimensions than we do. Um, and that's why it appears differently. Sometimes it appears to be some kind of almost physical moving kind of shape type thing. Um, but then it can transform into this almost like a human type glowing form of energy. Um, and I think it does, I think it changes shape and form because in certain shapes and forms it's easier for it to move, to change, to, to kind of like, uh, yeah, to move in time and space or in dimensions. It feels like it's dimensional. I got this sense of, uh, of a very dark area, but of energy bolting out. This was an apparition like moving quickly, um, a sentient being that is, um, and I kept on picking up energy management, but their energy is very directed. And I say apparition like smoky, but, uh, but moving with a sense of, of purpose. And now I see energy associated with this target, light energy. Dazzling, radiant, symbolic, exotic energy source with spiritual aspects. I get a sense that this light is somehow not just utilized, but, but worshipped. I, I sense, I see people making a pilgrimage to come witness this, to be bathed in it, to get energy from it, to utilize it, to have it be part of, an important part of their being in an almost religious sense, but also a utilitarian sense. And now people are witnessing something that has them spellbound. Uh, the word secret covenant comes to me. These are people bound by loyalty. Only a few can see this. These people are part of a, what's the word I want? A, not fraternity, a society, an order. They're, they're they're part of an order, and they're witnessing an energy event that has them spellbound. He is, uh, that's kind of pretty much what he looks like. He's um, quite tall. He may be bearded. Um, something that comes down like this behind him. I don't know if it's hair or a, like a hooded thing or what that is. I can't quite make it out. Um, may may have a bigger skull than normal. Uh, something piled up on his head, like a not a turban, but kind of sort of like a turban. Incredibly piercing eyes. This is a smart, smart guy. Oh, no, that's confusing. Uh, all in one dimensions, time and space aren't aren't disconnected. It's trying trying to show me. Um, oh, it's very complex. And um, there's a, there's an emotional attachment to this. This is a, this affects me pretty profoundly. Um, this.
there's a connection to that that is Father figure, a uh, our creator. Because human history is not what we're told. Uh, human history is much different, and we're learning every day more and more about um, how we got here, and what kind of uh, information and what kind of people have been out there. So, when remote viewers work a target, very often some of their data turns out to not be literally true. A remote viewer can provide information that is metaphorical. A remote viewer can give you a combination of really good data, some contamination, and even some bad data. It can be colored by the viewer's experiences and expectations. And sometimes it is possible that what the remote viewer might see could be a result of the expectations, the beliefs, and the constructs of the tasker himself. This is an interesting project. Did we solve the mystery? Well, we hope we gave you something to think about. <laughs>